Hey everybody, I'm Matthew Sheffield. Thanks for joining me today here on Theory of Change. We've got another great live show for everyone. Um, we just uh, as a little bit of housekeeping here before we get started though, uh, I wanted to remind everybody that Theory of Change is part of the Flux community network. It's a new uh, network of podcasts and articles uh, where we really delve in depth into the larger trends in politics, technology, religion, and media. So uh, be sure to check that out. The website address is flux.community. And then if you like what you have heard here today and then in, in the past, uh, we also have a Patreon. So you can go to patreon.com slash discover flux. Um, and then also, of course, Theory of Change is on Twitter. You can get that at um, at Theory Change on Twitter. And if you're on Twitter, of course, you are already seeing that. Um, but also, if you go to theoryofchange.show, you can get all the episode archives, including transcripts and all that good stuff and links to um, the guest um, information and books and uh, anything else uh, that we discuss on the show is all available there. Um, so, um, and then also, I did want to let everybody know that uh, you can submit questions here at the live format, depending on what platform you're using. Um, so we're streaming on Twitter and Facebook and also on YouTube. And um, it really helps get the discussion going if you can share those links to your own social networks while you're watching. We want to get as many people um, into the mix as we can uh, while we're doing the shows. It makes it a lot more interesting for everybody. So with that out of the way, um, I will get into the program portion here. So thanks for uh, watching, everybody. And uh, if you're watching later, you know, hello, um, non-live viewers as well. Um, so yeah. All right. Um, so every four years, the United States holds its presidential elections. But one year afterward, the states of New Jersey and Virginia hold their own gubernatorial elections. And for decades, the overwhelming trend in both states has been that the citizens vote for the governor is opposite from the current president's party. So in other words, if the current president is a Democrat, then usually the Republicans win in both Virginia and New Jersey. Um, but, and not all the votes are counted yet, but it looks like in Virginia, the historic trend has held and Republican Glenn Youngkin is on track to be the next governor. In New Jersey, however, the incumbent Democratic governor, Phil Murphy, seems like he has broken the historic streak and will remain in office for another four years. So we're going to be we're going to be talking about those trends and how influential they were on the, um, the results this year. But another factor worth discussing is the role played by the former President Trump in these races. Youngkin tried to stay away from Trump as much as possible publicly while also privately trying to work with various far right groups like the John Birch Society. So is the Youngkin strategy going to be a model for GOP candidates going forward or will Trump and his followers demand explicit public loyalty? Joining me to discuss this today is a senior editor with The Bulwark. His name is Jim Swift. And Jim is also a uh, one of the people who was an editor at the Weekly Standard, um, the long, uh, defunct, unfortunately for them, uh, public original never pump <laughs> original never Trump publication. So thank you for being here today, Jim. Matthew, thanks for having me. All right. Well, so um, as I said in the intro, um, you know the historic. I guess a lot of our political analysis. I think you know people like to say that political politics campaigning and whatnot is, is, is all data driven and everything like that. But the reality is politics is kind of fungible. Um, and we don't really know for sure um, what, you know, historic trends can always be broken at any moment. And, uh, but sometimes they're very strong. So uh, let's talk about, I mean, how, how much of a role do you think 
the sort of off year uh, election uh, jinx, if you will, for the president's party is? Um, you know, I mean, I, 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 I'm not one uh, who believes in ghosts necessarily, but uh, societally, societally, um, you know, there is sort of this knee jerk reaction, um, uh, de depending on whoever you elect, there's always an amount of buyer of buyer's remorse. And, um, you know, I think what um, what helped Biden very much uh, was that, you know, Donald Trump was so bad and uh, there were a bunch of Republicans and, you know, uh, I, I used to work with the Republican Voters Against Trump group, a sister organization of the Bulwark, you know, that was trying to help give people a sense of agency to break out of their historic tribalistic voting practices. Uh, but, uh, you know, you you. You look at this, and um, you, you just have to conclude. Well, we can we can talk about the campaigns in a minute here, but Terry McAuliffe was literally like the only person in recent memory to sort of break the off year, um, uh, post one year post presidential election cycle when he and he was he was gifted with the fact that he, he was facing a spectacularly bad opponent. Um, but uh, just for yeah, 2013, so, yeah. And yeah. maybe he thought he could ride lightning twice. And, you know, the Virginia Republicans, I mean, Virginia has gone from a red state to a purple state to what now it's not really a technical term, a bluish state. Um, and a large reason for that, I think, is someone who has lived here since 2007, is that Republicans have just historically put up bad candidates. Um, and uh, Glenn Youngkin, um, I have a lot of criticisms of him, um, was able to walk that tightrope and get to the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and um, a similar, you know, similar thing kind of happened in New Jersey, to, not quite for the Republicans, but, um, you know, if you look at the history of New Jersey, um, you know, you had a number of Republicans who had gotten elected as governor. So you had Chris Christie, uh, who got elected twice, um, and then you had Christine Todd Whitman, um, and, you know, and, and even further back, um, it goes. And so there is, it does, you know, there does seem to be in the case of Virginia. So, um, um, as you said, you know, Terry McAuliffe was the only one in recent memory. I, I actually went and looked, it was, it goes back to the 1970s, um, of somebody who was of the president's party who won in Virginia. Um, and, you know, it's, I guess you could argue to some degree that, uh, perhaps the reason McAuliffe won was that Obama had won so big in 2008 that he still had some residual, and he, you know, he won pretty well in, in 2012. Um, yeah, he did. That, um, and McAuliffe, I mean, let's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to, to talk about him, but we'll, we'll uh, maybe, we'll get into that a little bit more, but I guess, yeah, as you said, you know, he, I guess he thought he could capture lightning in a bottle, uh, because no Virginia governor has ever been <clears throat> elected twice either, um, except for one guy who started off as a segregationist Democrat, uh, who then later became a Republican. Um, uh, and then he ran uh, four years afterwards. So Virginia, yeah, just for everybody's reference, doesn't allow uh, governors to run for reelection um, after they've served four years. Now they can come back um, after they're out of office and try to try again, which Terry McAuliffe did. Um, so he was really up against kind of two or three major historic trends and thought he could do it. But ultimately, as we saw, he didn't. Um, now, uh, let's maybe go back to the, um, you, you were talking about how you, you thought that in Virginia, the gubernatorial candidates that Republicans had fielded were not very strong. Um, like, who, who are you referencing and what years? Let's talk about that a bit. Well, I mean, obviously, Ken Cuccinelli is like the model of a, of a, of a bad gubernatorial candidate. Um, but, but, but the other thing is, and I don't want to be mean to my former boss, Ed Gillespie, the former chair of the mm -hmm. RNC, where I, I once worked. Um, Ed Gillespie is a guy who was born in New Jersey, who worked his way up in politics, like working literally as a Senate parking lot attendant. Um, and, you know, uh, between uh, him and some of the other candidates that we've run, either at the Senate level or at the gubernatorial level, uh, you know, Prince William County uh, tends to give a lot of them. 
there's this pandering to the base issue um, that just really has isolated Northern Virginians. Um, you know, like the Confederate statues was, was one that really sunk at Gillespie, I thought. Like, you know, I'm from Ohio. You, you know, you're not going to get any argument from me about getting rid of Confederate statues. Ed Gillespie's from New Jersey. He shouldn't care either. Um, and he was standing up for him. <laughs> yeah. And, Very you know, bizarre, yeah. yeah. And it, it, it just, it, it, it doesn't seem genuine. And, um, you know, the, the, the issue that Youngkin ran into was the same thing that Gillespie and Cuccinelli before him um, uh, ran into, which is, you have to pander to a far right, very conservative, rural Southern base, but you also still have to win suburban voters. And what Gle uh, what uh, Youngkin was able to do was similar to what Bob McDonald was able to do. I mean, Bob McDonald, when he won, what was it in um, 2000 and 2013, 2013. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, hold on. It was, yeah, it was 2009. 2009. Yeah. Yeah. He was Bob McDonald did very well in the suburbs, and um, you know, two unique issues gave Glenn Youngkin this opportunity. One was Terry McAuliffe had a gaffe at one of their debates where he was talking about um, parents shouldn't have involvement over what is taught in schools. It was very inartful. It was overly broad, and it was clunky. Um, I understand what maybe he meant which is that, you know, when Youngkin ran a campaign ad um, uh, with, a, with a woman from Northern Virginia who was talking about some book uh, that her, her son was forced to read and how triggered he was, Glenn Youngkin picked a family that was like very, very Republican. They weren't just like your typical family. Her son is now an attorney for the National Republican Congressional Committee and the book was written by a Pulitzer Prize winner, and it was taught in an AP English class. Um, what Terry McAuliffe should have said is parents don't get a heckler's veto, but parents should be informed uh, over, you know, what sorts of sorts of materials are used and taught in schools. Um, but that's not exactly what he said. He said that parents shouldn't have a role. Parents have a role. They get to vote for their state legislators, and Republicans believe that Education should be controlled by state and local governments and not really the feds, with the exception of no child left behind. But let's not, you know, uh, get into a hypocrisy wormhole here. But they also get to vote for their PTA if they live in a city, which Virginia doesn't have many of them. Uh, most of them are counties, but they get to vote for, you know, PTA people. They get to vote for school board members. They get to vote for county supervisors and all these other things. But Terry botched this, and then there was this whole other issue of a, uh, well, there's that, which ties into critical race theory, and then there was this whole other issue about an alleged rape that happened in Loudoun County um, and um, transgender bathrooms. I don't think that was as impactful um, mm -hmm. uh, statewide, but it was locally, and Loudoun County is a very big growing county. Um, as it mm -hmm. has more and more and, Loud and Loudoun County, just for people not familiar, is is a exurban county in um, Virginia, just uh, out, a pretty kind of far out from DC, but a lot of people live there. Um, it's next to Dulles Airport. It's a big, you know, the growth there is tech um, because there's a big tech trunk line that goes there. Uh, it used yeah, to be Amazon sort of, has a big server farm in that area. Among yeah, us. it used to be like a NIMBY horse country county that like wanted to restrict its growth because they wanted to preserve their wealth. But now, like, it, it, if if you once you pass Dulles Airport, it doesn't look any different than Springfield or Alexandria or anything else. It's just you know, soulless townhomes row after row mm -hmm. um, that you know you, you could place anywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, and. Uh, just to set the scene a little bit for uh, people not familiar. So one thing that's kind of interesting about Virginia Republican politics, as opposed to any other state's politics, is that for whatever weird reason, uh, pretty much every Republican operative lives in Virginia. Um, <laughs> it, it, having been a Republican operative who lived in DC, it was always uncanny to me uh, just how few people who worked in Republican politics lived in Maryland or in DC. Um, and so there's just this, you know, 
any Republican politician who is in Virginia, you know, has just the surfeit of Republican pundits and operatives and think tankers who want to get involved with their campaign. Um, and so that's, uh, and that's probably, I guess that's probably you saw that as well in your own experience, right? Yes. Well, I mean, my native Ohio is home to astronauts, but Virginia is home to Republican pundits. Yeah, pretty interesting. And and that's not something you see discussed in uh, the national political media. So I wanted to just put that out there for everybody. Um, and it it's it is an important factor with some of these past Republican candidates uh, because, like Ken Cuccinelli, whom you mentioned, uh, and Ed Gillespie, um, you know, they were part of this Republican consultant tribe or mob, if you will, <laughs> um, that really has a stranglehold on Republican politics. And in the case of Cuccinelli, um, you know, he, he was more of kind of the far right um, tribe of Republican consultants, but, you know, he he uh, was able to leverage that into getting the nomination. And Ed Gillespie was more of the, you know, uh, um, we'll say chamber of commerce type Republican. Um, and there are a lot of those in Republican politics as well. Uh, yeah. So, unlike, but as a, Stewart, you know, who, uh, uh, unlike Corey Stewart, who was like a true believer, despite being from Minnesota, like he was Mr. Confederacy. He owns an old plantation. Ed Gillespie had to feign that. And if, you know, if, if, if you want to change topics about Glenn Youngkin's victory and how this is, you know, replicable elsewhere. I just don't think it is. And I think that's worth talking about. Yeah. Well, and that's, yeah. And that's why I wanted to set the stage a little bit though. Um, so yeah, but basically, so Corey Stewart, um, who was the Republican uh, gubernatorial nominee in Virginia in 2017, um, he pretty much ran on a neo-Confederate platform. Um, and, he, and he won that nomination um, over the opposition of, you know, the more country club chamber of commerce type Republicans. Um, they didn't want him, they opposed him, but he was able to get it in the primary. Um, and so uh, it seems like in 2020, they took some, in 2021, they took some serious uh, precautions to try to stop somebody like him. There's this woman named Amanda Chase, who Ta was Ta running as- can I, can I correct you here? Corey Stewart lost to Ed Gillespie for the nomination. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, he won the Senate nomination the following year. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so they, the Republican um, consultant class wanted to stop a repeat of this Corey Stewart sort of uprising. Um, and there was a very real chance of that through Amanda Chase, who was running, she called herself Trump in heels. Um, she's so crazy that uh, she's a... Um, serves in the Virginia state legislature um, and she refuses to wear a mask. So they make her stand in plexiglass uh, because she refuses to wear a mask. That's how crazy this this woman is. Um, and so um, the Republican Party of Virginia took a number, uh, some serious uh, sort of rule changes. Um, why don't you talk about those? You've written about that. I saw that over at the bulwark. Yeah, no. Uh, so the I, I called this a bastard primary, but, you know, for all the election trutherism that we've seen from the Republican prime, uh, from the Republican Party, um, you saw this. This was a huge thing uh, in the Republican primary. And we had Amanda Chase. We had um, Glenn Youngkin and, geez, I'm forgetting the, the third guy. Um, Pete Snyder. Pete Snyder. Thank you. And they were all talking about election integrity, but Amanda Chase is like a firm believer in all this election trutherism. And uh, look, Virginia has no history of corrupt elections in modern history. Um, Virginia runs very good and fair elections. In fact, every election that Virginia conducts is, au is audited automatically as a matter of state law. And, um, you know, so all three of these candidates the, that were really the only ones that had a shot had to pander to these election truthers, and some of whom literally believed that Virginia's election was stolen and Donald Trump actually won Virginia, um, you know, which is bonkers. It's just bonkers to me. Uh, but uh, in an effort to prevent, 
you know, this repeat of having Corey Stewart sort of like almost hijack things and Ed Gillespie barely winning and then having to cater to those same people again, uh, they came up with this scenario where they opted out completely of the state running the election and they ran a uh, Virginia GOP run convent drive through convention. This was the same thing they did to screw over Denver Riggleman. Uh, the former congressman from Virginia's 5th District who voted for impeachment, who's working now on the January 6th committee um, to hand the election to Jerry Falwell's buddy, Reverend Bob Good. And so they had these like 34 drive through sites where between the hours of nine and four, you had to like literally sit there in line and um, uh, wait until you could get a ballot. And then, you know, you had to present this, but you also had to sign and, and this was this was the most bizarre thing. I mean, because you remember at the very beginning, Republicans were concerned that Trump wasn't truly a Republican. And so they made everyone sign these these sort of affidavits saying that if I lose the primary, I promise to support the Republican nominee. Virginia took that to like a methamphetamine level where uh, they not only made people like promise that they would be voting for the Republican nominee if their candidate lost, but that, that they would not vote in any Democratic primaries for like five years. And if they did, they wouldn't be able to vote in future Republican primaries because apparently this is their new model going forward. And I mean, keep in mind, this is the same Republican Party that didn't have a Republican primary in Virginia when there were challengers to Donald Trump in 2020. Uh, and so I voted in the Democratic primary for Joe Biden. Because uh, there wasn't a Republican one. And I probably still would have voted for Biden because he needed all the help he could get at the time. But, like, you know, there were legitimate Republican challengers. Bill Weld, Joe Walsh, um, you know, the guy from South Carolina, Mark Sanford, who went on the Appalachian Trail, was in it briefly. Um, it, but, like, the party that canceled its own Republican primary to help Donald Trump is, like, demanding this total fealty and making you sign a, a probably unenforceable contract. And they did this solely for the explicit reason of screwing over Amanda Chase. Um, and I wasn't sure how it was going to go because uh, people who are nuts enough to support Amanda Chase uh, are probably going to take paid time off to do it. Um, but, I, you know, I think that the never Trump political gravity did come home and, uh, you know, I, I might be on the more extreme end. But it was just like, you're, you're offering me three bad choices that I don't want to be governor. And uh, you're asking me to drive and then spend like an hour and a half waiting in my car like it's a COVID test. Uh, whereas you could have just had a normally run government election and I could have done it. No, I'm not going to do that. But people did. And I think a lot of uh, young kids success can be attributed to Yes, people want to get past Trump, but uh, political gravity also does pull people back to earth. Like there are a lot of Biden Youngkin voters. Um, some of them just hate staying home with their children, but um, you know, a lot of them feel dirty for voting for Biden um, and want to feel like they're members of the tribe again. Uh, but spoiler alert, they aren't. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, and I'm just going to look at some of the exit polls here in a second. But so ultimately, though, Youngkin managed to come out ahead in that um, and uh, became the nominee. And in the uh, general election, you know, he 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 found some difficulty with the fact that in order to try to you know, stop some people from going over to Amanda Chase and whatnot. He got very big into election trutherism, you know, talked about, oh, we're going to have voting, ref you know, election integrity and all that nonsense. And, and the thing is, they never can specify any examples of fraud. Um, and But it doesn't matter uh, to people. Um, and, you know, a lot of that comes to this long-standing Republican myth of well before Trump that that Republicans, when they lose, it's because of Democratic voter fraud. Like this is a long-standing Republican um, conspiracy theory, right? I'm sure you saw that, right? Yeah, it is. And, you know, I mean, 
they're talking about dead people voting and this mm -hmm. this might be an unpopular position but like if you died the day before the election and you cast an early vote why shouldn't mm -hmm. your vote count? like you know you, you did you didn't die a year ago i mean there's a very mm -hmm. narrow specific window on when you can when you can vote early and everyone's like oh look at all these dead people who voted and you know brad raffensperger uh secretary of state in georgia has a book out about it and Trump totally believed all these conspiracy theories that it was like thousands and thousands of people. And granted, I mean, thousands of thousands of people needlessly died because of his horrific response to coronavirus, um, you know, which is in a way ironic, but like it was actually, you know, like a K it, 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 like he, he was saying thousands and thousands and it was actually a very small number. But like, my thought is if like, if you're an eligible registered voter, and you're casting your vote and you die because of a global pandemic we're like we're expecting government to like go so deep to make sure your vote doesn't count like th mm -hmm. that's the difference between republicans and democrats is that republicans come up with ways to try and make sure that voting is tightly restricted and coming up with creative legal ways to make sure your vote doesn't count Democrats do the opposite, but I think most people are in the middle and it's just like, you know, if my grandma, you know, went, went to the firehouse the day before she died and voted for George W. Bush, I would have think, I would think that her vote should have counted, you know, like. Yeah. Well, in, in terms of the way pretty much every state um, election laws are, if a candidate who is on the ballot dies themselves, the candidate dies. Look at John They're Ashcroft still on the ballot. Uh, John yeah. Ashcroft, you know, I mean, it's it's uh, not John yeah. Ashcroft. You mean Mel Carnahan? Mel Carnahan, sorry, yeah. In Missouri, yeah, um, yeah, it's and and that's happened uh, several different times. Like um, Sonny Bono, the the Repu former Republican congressman, died, um, and he was still on the ballot, and, and then his wife took the seat <laughs> um, after he, you know, after it was over. And that's just the way things are. But I mean, I mean, ultimately, though, but it's not just that. It's also there's this um, what I there's this very strange sort of demarcation I found between a lot of Republican activists or commentators um, like they don't know how the political consultants are doing things. Um, so in other words, Republican con political consultants know that the public doesn't support cutting, you know, the Department of Education or eliminating Social Security. Like they know all that stuff um, and they act accordingly, uh, whereas the Republican, you know, activist base has no idea that their policy ideas are are pretty unpopular with most Americans. Would you agree with that, that they don't know that? Yeah, I mean, I, I like so the, the great I mean, my degree was in marketing, but the great advertising uh, genius, David Ogilvy, uh, said something that has always stuck with me, and it's that you can't save souls in an empty church. And I think that these political consultants know this, um, and it's just sort of gotten progressively worse and worse over time in that, uh, you know, they know they're losing people in church, but like, if, if, if your messaging is no, getting rid of the Department of Education and, you know, taking its budget to zero dollars, raising the building, you know, and, and, you know, selling it to someone to drill oil in Washington, D.C., won't sell. They're like, well, actually, you know, we can find a middle ground. And I think that's the thing about consultants is they always try and find a middle ground and they try and find a way to soften it. And I think the way that Glenn Youngkin did in a way that he was able to do that Ed Gillespie wasn't able to do was because of that bastard primary. He didn't have to go through the same, like Republican, Republican nut jobs, uh, you know, like they call them, they call them Hyden Joe Biden. Right. And that worked out actually quite well for Joe Biden that he, he didn't have to go out and be on rope lines and being asked questions. Uh, the, the same is also true of Glenn Youngkin. He did not have to, deal with a traditional campaign because Republican gurus at the, you know, Virginia GOP 
finally had the smarts to say like, we need to outsmart the Rubes. And that's what they did. But then Youngkin had to walk that tightrope for the entirety of things. Um, and look, I, I think back to 2008 when John McCain uh, was confronted by a woman at a town hall. Uh, it was a birther. And uh, John McCain shut her down and was like, no, he's a he's not a Muslim. He was born in America. Uh, you know, he's a good man and all this other sort of stuff. Like he, he literally like took the extreme of his party and he basically said, no, GFY, you are wrong. You know, it was like the let's go Brandon of the John McCain movement. And I, I respect the heck out of that. Uh, yeah. Glenn, Although, but then he went and nominated Sarah Palin, who is, you know, has, is a total Christian nationalist, believes in Satan, demon possession and exorcisms and like participated in those at her church and People don't know that about her, actually. Well, right, because she was a Pentecostal. Um, I'm not saying the guy is perfect, but when he was campaigning, he had the gumption and the balls to do things that, like, Glenn Youngkin didn't. And, mm -hmm. you know, literally a woman went to up to Glenn Youngkin and said that the election was stolen in Virginia, and Glenn Youngkin basically was just, just let it, like, shoot past his shoulder. And... That's unfortunately the status quo in Republican politics right now. And that's what the Virginia GOP learned from that lesson is like, you cannot be mean to the base. And if you're mean to the base, you're going to lose. But, you know, they also nominated people who only placated the base. Um, and the reason why Glenn Youngkin cannot happen anywhere else is because these state Republican parties, I don't think, are going to be able to pull off what Virginia did during the middle of a pandemic, the sham bastard primary, uh, mm -hmm. like you're, you're not gonna be able to do this in any other state because the Trumpkins are going to insist that, you know, the one true Scots- The truth in your flag. Yeah, well, and then Trump and himself, and Trump himself, um, you know, he, after, after the election was over, um, so today it's Thursday, November 4th, um, on the Wednesday yesterday, um, after, you know, it became evident that Youngkin was going to win, you know, Trump came out with a, a press release and said, well, you know, uh, I really won Virginia in 2020. And um, I'm, you know, Glenn Youngkin is not more popular than me. Um, and so, you know, he's not going to stand for people keeping him at arm's length. Um, he's just but, but, not going to. But he did in that instance. I mean, he's not yeah. doing that in Arizona. He's not doing that in Georgia. And uh, Glenn Youngkin isn't going to say shit. Like, Glenn Youngkin is not going to be like, actually, I am more popular and go fly a kite. You yeah. know, he's, he's literally just going to keep his head down. He's just going to put his head in the sand. And that's the model. And if you think you can replicate that in every state across the country that is, uh, that is you know, purplish or bluish, uh, good luck. I don't think you can. I, I just yeah. think that a series of gaffes by Terry McAuliffe, a series of campaign mistakes, and uh, the Republican Party of Virginia, like, for once making a, like a good decision in their favor, uh, it all worked out. But, like... I, you cannot remanufacture this. Uh, mm -hmm. and I lost a bet to a Youngkin strategist about Youngkin's chances, and I'm going to buy him steak and a bottle of bourbon. But um, I, I, I would still make that bet in a lot of other states, um, you know, because uh, the demographics are changing in Georgia. They're changing in Texas. They're changing in Arizona. And uh, if you think you can, you know, have smoke-filled room prime, like, you know, meddling that changes the primary that people are used to uh, when the pandemic is over. Good luck. I don't think you're going to sell people on that because the, the base wants Trump. That's all they want. Yeah. Um, and uh, just before we get into the next section here, um, I'm going to send you the retweet of the show so you can uh, let your followers know about it um, so we can get them in the mix here and copy the. I'll send it to you in our private chat here. Um, okay. Do you see it there on the on the side? Yeah, sharing it right now. Okay, great. Um, yeah. So, uh, it, it, I yeah, I, I think Trump isn't going to let people um, 
try to do that. And but ultimately, though, like this is the natural progression, I would say, of where conservative politicking uh, began. I mean, you know, if you go back and, as I said, you know, the public opinion polls have showed that uh, Republicans, all the all the popular positions that Republicans had, they achieved what they wanted. So in terms of like, um, let's say, gun gun rights or some additional restrictions on abortion, um, things like that, or, um, you know, more military spending, like those were all things that Republicans achieved um, pretty much. And then they were left with all their unpopular positions like, you know, eliminate the Department of Education or, you know, drastically cut Social Security, privatize it. Um, these are the positions that Republicans were left with. And, and Trump actually campaigned against them in 2016. And that was why a lot of Republican uh, commentators and whatnot hated Trump um, originally. And, but then once in office, of course, he didn't do any of the things that he said. Um, but I mean, if you look and go back, you know, Trump was saying, oh, we're going to raise taxes on billionaires. We're going to close the carried interest loophole tax, um, you know, tax loophole. We're going to, um, you know, br bring home all the troops immediately. We're going to, you know, have more regulations on things. We're going to have a higher minimum wage. We're going to have a healthcare system that takes care of everyone, everything. Um, that's what the Trump 2016 uh, promise was. And of course, he didn't do any of that. Um, and so now Republicans are left with these policy positions and they won't modify them. Um, and instead, they decided they you know, they're going to bring in the crazies and empower them. I mean, that's pretty much what the Trump administration was, was it not? I mean, it was it was a it was a bowling ball for a formerly serious party. Uh, you know, you, you like you you look at their 2020 platform and they just determine we're not going to have one. We're just going to do whatever Donald Trump wants to do. Uh, you know, I mean, Glenn Youngkin was uh, successful on his education uh binge there at the end uh and you know i think a large part of that could be tied to the fact that people didn't like having to be stay-at-home parents for a year and a half not that everyone loves going to an office but uh after the success of glenn youngkin's election you saw um uh kevin mccarthy pushing we're going to have federal legislation I mean, this is this is the Republican Party that used to be states and local governments should be in charge of education, not the feds. But I mean, with the asterisks of no child left behind, because, you know, they can never be hypocrites. Uh, but, you know, now he's like, we're going to push for parental note a federal parental notification law. And I I said something that should be called the kindergarten awareness, you know, uh, responsibility, education, notification act or the Karen Act. I mean, Literally, the GOP and Glenn Youngkin were pandering to Karens uh, who wanted to, uh, you know, be, be that one person who takes one book out of the classroom. And uh, McAuliffe bungled that, and uh, Youngkin actually did a good job, unfortunately, um, because I, I don't agree. I don't agree that uh, nut job parents should have a heckler's veto um, over controversial works. If you don't like that, homeschool your kids or send them to Catholic schools or private schools or parochial schools, um, you know. Well, now here's you're uh, uh, still in touch with some conservative pundits, right? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, the ones okay, who still well, talk to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, likewise, uh, a, a lot of people have uh, decided they want to block me on Twitter rather than debate me, um, which... Uh, which is funny considering they always call other people snowflakes. Um, but the of the ones that I know, um, a lot of them, they just don't seem to be aware of how these school board meetings um, are being disrupted and what people are doing in them. Um, like they just have no idea that, you know, of the death threats that school officials are facing. And, um, and you know, I see that I, I see that with you know regular Republican voters who I know that they have no idea how insane these people are um, in these school board meetings. Um, is have you seen that or 
is this willful ignorance or, or what is this in your opinion? I think, I, you know, that's, that's a very good point, Matthew. I think it's a combination of both. Uh, I think on one hand, there's willful ignorance, but I think on the other hand, it's just absolute straight ignorance. Uh, a lot of people who work in right-wing punditry are under the age of 30. They've never worked for the government. They've never worked for the campaign, uh, at a campaign of any sort. You know, they're basically like Meghan McCain. Like, they, like maybe they lucked into their job or maybe they earned it. But like if you work for an elected official, you know what death threats are. When the Capitol Police starts like emailing you like handouts of this person threatened to kill your boss, here's their picture, here are their details, this is the person's name and all this other stuff, you start taking that seriously. Because, you know, I mean, when I was working for Senator Kyle from Arizona, I mean, Gabby Giffords got shot up at a town hall meeting. Um, uh, and, you know, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm 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 on my local HOA board. I've not thankfully gotten any death threats, but you know, uh, anyone who's ever worked in electoral politics, whether as a staffer or an elected official themselves or a director, is, is the technically known in an HOA sense, knows that this is not something you do to make friends. And people get really pissed off. You got to go to court. You got to put liens on people's houses. It's uh, it's yeah. It, it's 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 stuff that gets people emotive and frustrated, and um, you know. And then you add on having to enforce, you know, mask uh, safety precautions and things like that. Yeah. Uh, it just makes some people insane. And I'm actually going to play a, a clip of some of these people, just for any uh, stray Republican consultant. Uh, who may be watching right now. You want to wear snot on your face all day? Fine, you do you, boo. But don't force that non-science, satanic BS on our kids. The wind that is blowing through the black people, through the white people, through the Chinese people, they are blowing through your veins. These are demonic entities and all the school boards of all the United States of America. Go back to fucking medical school. Man. By putting masks on these kids' face, you can't identify any of them. Voting on this tells me you guys support sex trafficking. The Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and the Federalist Papers, and also the Bible, and these guarantee my freedom and yours and our children's to breathe Time. oxygen. You dealt with sheep, now prepare yourself to deal with lions. What you've done, you've poked the cubs. And no one's gonna mess with our cubs. And let me tell you something, go home tonight and take one of these spoons and put it on your vaccination spot. Guess what? It's going to stick to you. Are you going to the state and asking where they got their science? If you're going to tell me the CDC, come on, guys. Forcing our children to wear masks is nothing short of psychological child abuse on the altar of wokeness. Do you have any idea what's in a vaccine? E. coli, pig blood, detergent. This is not a joke. There are COVID camps. Concentration camps were something that the Nazis did. Your children and your children's children will be subjugated. They will be asked, have you been a good little Nazi? Hey, you Fauci! God bless. See ya. Oh, yeah. When, when we reopened, Matthew, when we reopened our HOA pool, when I moved in my community, our, we closed our pool for the first year of coronavirus. And when we reopened it, there was still an outdoor mask mandate uh -huh. in Virginia, if you weren't in the pool. And someone got very, very angry about this. And uh, I said, you know, I'm sorry. You know, like when you're on the board of an HOA, you have fiduciary duty. You are exempted by business judgment if you make a mistake, you know, if you think you're acting in the best interest of the community. But like if there's an executive order out there that says that if you're not in the pool, you have to wear a mask unless you're six foot away from someone. And this was months before we even reopened the pool. I said, we're going to follow that. And the person goes, those things don't have the full force of law. And I was just like, I regret to inform you that's totally false. And like, that's that's as extreme as I dealt with in my mm -hmm. role with a uh, it's not a public official but you know like being someone who is elected to a role to to roll something but I see all of those sorts of things and it just gave me horrible flashbacks to when I worked in the Senate and the House of Representatives and um you know I don't care if someone votes against me or thinks I, I, I'm bad um, mm -hmm. I, I'm just gonna do what's right but like I I've seen like 
and I've taken phone calls that sound as insane as those clips you played uh, on mm -hmm. a daily basis. And I think that's where right wing pundits don't really understand the base or maybe secretly some of them do. And they think they want to like placate or pander to them. But like um, it, it, unless you've had a death threat coming into your workplace, um, you know, you, you might you might view some of those crazy people a little bit differently. Yeah, well, and um, I think, you know, that it's kind of this, um, you know, like these people who, who in the clip I just played, you know, that's who is now empowered in the Republican Party for a long time. So these people were always out there with these strange, you know, satanic conspiracy, uh, uh, violent, you know, attitudes. They were always out there, but Republicans, you know, kind of kept them down um, and refused. Now they still wanted their votes and they would still privately pander to them. Um, but they never let them kind of have their way publicly. And, and now, you know, the cat is fully, or the Pandora's box is completely opened. And I mean, do you think Republicans can ever close that box? Um, I mean, what's the future of the Republican Party looking like, in your opinion? No, I, I don't think they can close that box because what used to be a periodic dog whistle is now basically like they found a way to mechanize it where the whistle is constantly blowing. And, you know, that's that's why I was not a fan of Glenn Youngkin is because he didn't have that courage. He didn't have that fortitude that John McCain did. Now, you know, as you previously brought up, yet John McCain screwed up by nominating Sarah Palin. But John McCain at least had the courage to confront people in public on camera and say, no, what you're saying is nonsense. And Republicans don't do that anymore. Uh, not mm -hmm. not at all. And um, really, I think the only way we solve it is making sure that they all lose. Uh, you know, it, like it, it, it needs to be rebuilt, you know, uh, you know, like, like an old stadium. You love the stadium, but like, you know, you know that the internal supports and the structures are cr crumbling and you can't do anything about it. Um, you know, uh, save what you can. And there's not much to save in the Republican Party, uh, but um you know i'm some people call it the burn it all down camp um that's personally kind of where i am anyone who's party to trump trumpism election denial uh or QAnon or any of these other sorts of conspiracies and if they were given an opportunity to say no you're wrong and uh you know just look the other way i can't support you um you know unfortunately the coalition of people like me is not huge uh, and we saw that with the election of Glenn Youngkin. Um, you know, if, if you look at the voters that uh, helped deliver, I mean, Biden was going to win Virginia no matter what. Let's be let's be clear here. But if you look at the coalition of lifelong Republicans and conservatives who voted for Biden, and then you looked at the people who uh, went back, gravity always wins. People always want to go back to their tribe. And that's my most concerning thing, um, because not only did Glenn Youngkin win, Winsome Sears, the lieutenant governor candidate, who uh, I think is horrific, uh, uh, won too. And she could be put in a place where if there's a tie in the Virginia Senate, she's casting the thing, basically, and depending on the issue, giving Virginia Republicans control of all, th all three, House, Senate, and uh, House of Delegates, the Senate, and uh, having Glenn Youngkin sign something in the law. I mean, th th I, I, th I think this woman's crazy. Um, you know, Jason Miaris, you know, uh, I don't think is as crazy as Winston Sears. Uh, he's the new incoming attorney general, but he had the advantage, as you pointed out earlier, Virginia governors can't run for re-election, but lieutenant governors and attorney general, attorneys general can. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Herring has been around for a long time and uh, both of them benefited from the coattails uh, of Youngkin. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's, you know, I, I don't think it can be solved until these people start losing. And yeah. Well, and I, I think one thing that Youngkin had as an advantage um, that past Republican candidates in Virginia, gubernatorial candidates, hadn't had is that there's just 
uh, there's been a massive, massive build out of right wing media in Virginia and nationally um, since. I mean, literally since Ed Gillespie ran. Uh, excuse me. Uh, literally since Ed Gillespie ran, and so you know you you've got uh, a profusion of of talk shows in there. Um, you've got this guy uh, who is the the guy behind Steve Bannon's podcast is actually a Virginia um, talk show host, and he started up uh, multiple websites in Virginia. Um, and uh, you know, so it that enable, and then you've had several large um, far right websites have run have cre been created since um, just since then um, that are pushing conspiracy theories and false reporting and uh, like you mentioned um, this ca supposed case of a transgender sexual uh, assault um, that happened in Loudoun County in in Virginia and that story was brought to national prominence by the Daily Wire um, which is this insane Republican website. Um, and they lied. Uh, they, they ran a report with the father of, of a high school, uh, a female high school student that, um, he was claiming that she had been, um, raped by a transgender person. And it took place, uh, after they had a inclusive bathroom policy. So, and basically nothing that he said was true in terms of that. It wasn't a transgender person. The, the assault happened uh, before the policy happened, um, and then as it, and then he was the student was able to, you know, continue attending schools. But that was a policy that the Trump administration forced on students. So, in other words, they uh, Betsy DeVos, the former Secretary of Education, she said it was you know her strong preference that students accused of sexual crimes. Uh, would not lose access to continue going to school. So she, that was the policy basically that Trump wanted. So everything that was in that Daily Wire story, the, all the important parts of it was a lie. Um, but it wasn't until right before the election that the truth came out. And by that time, and even now today, if you talk to your average Virginia Republican, you know, they still, I will believe, um, all the lies that, that they were fed in the beginning. And, and it made it a lot easier for Glenn Youngkin because he didn't have to fan, you know, talk about critical race theory and transgender bathrooms nonstop because he had a propaganda organizations that were doing it for him every single day. Right. Yeah, no. And, you know, I mean, it's a lie will get halfway around the world before the time truth has an opportunity to catch up. And uh, I mean, like, if you actually did pay attention to this story and uh, you, you did care about this story, you would have found that, um, you know, yes, it is true that the, uh, the, the girl who was claiming sexual assault, um, and I'm, I am personally a firm believer in believe all women. If she didn't, if she says she didn't consent, I'm inclined to believe this person, but it's hard. It, 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 it is hard to know these sorts of things when it becomes a he said, she said, or, you know, if we're getting the case of trans, you know, whatever preferred pronoun said situation. But what we later found out were two things that the Daily Wire didn't report, as you as you point out. One, the trans bathroom policy was not in effect when this alleged assault occurred. And two, uh, this person was not like snuck up, uh, snuck up upon behind, you know, in the bathroom by some person pretending to be trans to be a rapist. They, in fact, had, you know, multiple consensual sexual encounters uh, previously in that bathroom. And that day it did not go uh, in a way, you know, which is to say, let's just take a step back. Consent is consent. And if it wasn't given, that's rape. But the way it was represented was not the way uh, the way that it was represented in the media, uh, as we later found out, according to, you know, uh, court documents and, um, uh, you know, reality when it comes to the, the county's bathroom policies, uh, those things weren't in accordance. Um, but, you know, people, you know, a, 
people don't go and they, they once they believe a lie uh, or they believe aspects in this case I'm not saying it's a lie that this this girl was sexually assaulted I believe her uh, but when it when other things are compa uh, compacted and added into that uh, they will believe those and then that becomes their narrative because there's no incentive to go back and check nobody wants to go check their priors yeah well all right so now you're at the bulwark uh and t tell us for those who are not familiar with the bulwark um like you guys kind of i feel like you started off trying to sort of save the republican party perhaps uh but things have changed a little bit for you guys is that right <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, for, for those who aren't familiar with us, um, I would say that, I mean, the, the, the way the bulwark started was that uh, most of us all worked at the Weekly Standard, and um, we were very Trump critical, and uh, we all lost our jobs um, because we were Trump critical. Um, I mean, that, that might be oversimplifying things. I mean, we, we had the weekly standard we, we definitely you were canceled what canceled? No. <laughs> you know, we you know we, we 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 fought with our we fought with our parent company over how we wanted the website to to be run so like it was it was a combination of issues but being a never trump conservative political publication is not a great business proposition in the sense that like i mean none, none of these publications really make money as you know um, you know, it's a, it's a matter of how much you're willing to write off as a loss as a rich person. Um, and uh, after we got shut down, uh, you know, like five of us uh, started the bulwark. And it used to be a sleepy, never Trump aggregator. And then we started doing original content. Um, and then a year later, uh, you know, a bunch of our former compatriots started the dispatch, um, you know, which is... Um, you know, uh, in a, in a, in a very close lane to us. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's an interesting place to be in, but what we try to do is to be not tribal, um, because we don't have a tribe anymore. Um, and we want to tell people what we really think. And, you know, there are times where you run into an issue where when you tell people or they really think, if they haven't known you long enough, they're like, oh, my gosh, they get really mad. Like, did Joe Biden screw up Afghanistan and the withdrawal? Yeah. Did the Democrats screw up this election? Yeah, they did. And, you know, we're going to tell you why we think that is based on our experience. Um, it doesn't always appeal to everyone. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're a publication that is largely free. But if you like what we do, we offer we offer more content if you want to pay us 10 bucks a month or a hundred dollars a year um and now how much uh, can i ask so how how is it different from when you, you were at the weekly standard when that existed in terms of the self-censorship of stories or ideas that republicans i mean was that something that existed before uh oh we can't say this because the republicans won't like it or so and so won't like it no, I, I don't think we I don't think we had a lot of self censorship censorship, at least in my personal experience back in the standard mm -hmm. days, because, um, you know, I really got to write what I wanted in my newsletter and I got myself in trouble for it a handful of times. Um, but um, the, the I, I think the interesting thing is when it comes to tribalism, uh, there are all of these people that if they write for you for years, they keep writing for you and they propose things. And when we built the weekly standard, uh, when, excuse me, when we built the bulwark um, and, you know, uh, it wasn't like a quinceanera. Everybody knew we were never Trumpers and we were, and we paid our own personal price for it. Right. Um, but uh, it was interesting to see a lot of people who used to write for us, just kind of like fade off into the sunset, um, you know, because we weren't backed by a billionaire anymore <laughs> and the, you know, they weren't going to get their payday. And, you know, they, they, they knew that, um, uh, you know, like we, we were, we were a hungry startup and, um, you know, the irony is, is, you know, the beauty of when we built the bulwark is we wanted to do a bunch of things. One, we wanted to not have intrusive ads, 
like our parent company used to have pop-ups, you know, interstitials and all this other stuff. Uh, and we wanted to pay writers good money um, uh, because our previous company uh, kind of put arsenic in our soup and wouldn't let us do that. Um, so I, I, I think that there is a, there is a market for us. Um, it may not be the biggest market in the world, um, but um, we've been successful beyond our wildest dreams. And uh, I'm really proud of what we put together. And um, we've been able to work with some sort of folks uh, that uh, since, you know, we are out in our own kind of wilderness as never Trump conservatives that previously might not have wanted to associate themselves with a, you know, neoconservative publication. So how much, um, I mean, have your your guys' views changed? I mean, let's say yours in particular or some others, you know, some of your colleagues, have any of your views changed in retrospect? So um, I, 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 think it, I think it depends largely on the person. Um, most of my views personally haven't changed. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, I worked for Senator John Kyle from Arizona. I worked for Congressman Jeff Davis from Kentucky. They were both members of the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee. And for my five years in Congress, I spent so much of my life working on tax reform, taking meetings about tax reform, listening to what my boss, uh, whoever it was at the time, thought about tax reform. And then Republicans just rushed through a very bad tax reform bill. Uh, under Trump, just to get a victory, uh, which is unlike the Democrats right now, um, you know, who are are literally arguing about like the paint on the walls, and you know, in, in the house, uh, the, you know, that they want to build, and it's just um, it it is bef it is befuddling to me. Um, but the Republicans, I mean, look, I, I, I believe that you should legislate correctly. You should legislate deliberatively and thoughtfully. And Republicans did do that for a bunch of years. And then they're like, well, we just have to rush through what we can get passed while we have the window to do it. And now Democrats, you know, I mean, we're all seeing Copy the same thing. Yeah. 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 But uh, they're rushing. They're, their deliberative period is basically less than a year. Right. Yeah. Um, at least, yeah. I mean, they have at least have some. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm like, if you look at the Republican Obamacare, you know, uh, like they they didn't have one for a long time, and then they came out with one in about a month. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> no. No. Tried to shove it through. I, I think that's a good um, comparison because, like, you look at BBB and BIF, and it's just like they're basically like arguing on a year for basically like the new New Deal, and. Um, I don't know. It's just <sighs> governing is hard. And now Democrats are finding out what Republicans like John Boehner and Paul Ryan had to deal with, with the Tea Party. Um, but it looks like the progressives slash the squad are eventually going to go along with something. Um, because on, on the far left, they have that. And then on the far right of the Democratic caucus. They have Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, And you have to please both of those sides. And fighting a multi-front war is hard. Um, so, you know, it's it, it, it's quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I one thing that I have thought um, that is kind of interesting about what you guys are doing is that, you know, there are a lot of people who you know, I know now uh, who started off as Republicans and, you know, eventually decided, wow, this, this party is totally insane. I had no idea how crazy they were and how, what I was contributing to. So they walked away from it and became independents or Democrats. And, you know, there is something to be said for people who are going to try to stay in place and, you know, fight against the crazies. Um, so, I mean, is that, that it, have people privately said to you guys, you know, I, I, I can't publicly support what you're doing, but, but I'm glad you're there. Um, is, have any Republicans said that to you guys? Yeah. I mean, some have, I mean, in, in a way, in and in, I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, shine your shoes. You were ahead of the curve compared to us in terms of 
seeing the sorts of problems of the Republican Party. Um, you know, for most of us, it, it, it took Trump for us to get to that point. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's it's you saw during the four years of Trumpism, you know, these political playbook items about like, oh, my gosh, he's insane. And you're seeing it in all of these like ex post facto, like post mortems from people who worked in the Trump administration, uh, like about how crazy he is like, look at Stephanie Grisham's new book, like, hey, now I'll take your questions. Ha ha ha. Like, that's funny. Um, mm -hmm. it, 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 I don't consider myself a Republican anymore. I consider myself conservative. Um, and the reason why is because I took the January 6th attack so personally, because I worked in the Congress, in the Congress of the United States for five years. And I, 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 I consider it a second home and I worked there as a, I worked there as a staffer. I worked there as a journalist and, you know, seeing what happened and then Republicans basically saying, no, we don't want to look into any of this. Um, mm -hmm. that just left a very sour taste in my mouth that I, I, as long as those people are still running the Republican party, I can't consider myself one of them. Um, but I'm still a conservative. Um, and so, but I, the, yeah, well, it's, it's kind of interesting though, trying to, there's kind of an emerging space of somewhat Trumpers though now. So you've got people, let's say like, well, like Mike Pence or, um, or, or Alyssa Farah or, you know, who, or even Liz Cheney to some degree that are like, yeah, I'll uh, go along with Trump unless he does some things I don't like. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that that's a fun, that is a workable position in the long run because, you know, it means that at some point you're going to have to sublimate yourself and submit to him because that's who he is. He will not tolerate partial loyalty. No, no, he, he absolutely won't. And, you know, I mean, we, we've already seen, I mean, granted, the Democrats redistricted Kinzinger's seat in Illinois, and he's out. Who knows what Liz Cheney's future holds? My former high school classmate, Anthony Gonzalez, congressman from Northeastern Ohio, Ohio 16, is out. Um, you know, you, you look at the like 10 or so people uh, who've had the courage to stand up to Trump the second time. And not not all of them did. In fact, what none of them in the House had, had that courage the first time, uh, and they should have. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like it, it, like you said, it's it, it is a zero tolerance zero tolerance for dissent sort of movement, and they are going to be forcibly thrown into the wilderness with us. Uh, what they do next is up to them. You know, Adam Kinzinger wants to run for governor as independent. Good for him. I'd support him. He's he's a good guy. Um, but uh, they did go along with it for almost all of it until the very end. And, um, you, you know, uh, this literally the second you cross him, you know, um, who was that senator from Nevada? Was it was it it wasn't Ensign. Uh, was it Ensign? Um, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he, he was early to cross Trump. And like you just saw, this is how Trump's going to deal with Congress. And it was just like, if, if you say something's bad, I mean, Trump literally transformed the Republican Party, which was historically the Chamber of Commerce Free Trade Party, into trade wars are good and easy to win. Mm -hmm. And they all went along with it. Um, I mean, with the exception of a couple people, but like, it's, uh, it's, th that's the future of the Republican Party is... The, the people who are remotely once like me as a staffer uh, mm -hmm. or bosses I worked for will all get pushed off the conveyor belt. And yeah. then it's just going to be this new party. And, you know, I mean, you've seen a rise of neoliberalism in the Democratic Party, but uh, I don't think that they're going to like Sherrod Brown is not going to become a free trader to own the cons. You know, <laughs> neither is Tim. Mm -hmm. Ryan. Yeah, um, well, and that's uh, I think a lot of that, though kind of goes back to the the motivation for a, a huge percentage of people who are in Republican politics. It isn't the ideas. It isn't the policy. It's actually Christian supremacism. Um, and it's an uncomfortable idea sometimes to consider. But like when you look at 
like I, I I'll give you an example. Like there's a guy that I know who I worked with on a TV project that um you know he he told me he was going to support Ted Cruz in 2016 because that's what the Christians are doing. Um, like that was his idea. And when you look at uh, Republican, you know, voters, there's this very strong idea of a, a Christian supremacy, you know, domination that's under attack and we have to do anything to preserve our Christian society. So like uh, Emerald Robinson, who is a White House correspondent for Newsmax, you know, she tweeted um, just a couple of weeks ago how I don't want to live in a multicultural society. I want to live in a Christian society. And that ultimately, I think, is a huge motivator for a lot of Republicans. And it's something that I think, you know, people in your own case may not have noticed it or, be, you know, to some degree. I don't know. What's your, what's your reaction to that? Um, you know, so I think if I'm thinking about my political journey and where I started um, coming, because for, for people who are watching who, who, you know, have no idea who I am and I don't expect they would, um, you know, my first job in politics was in 1999 as an intern for a state rep in Cleveland, Ohio, and his chief of staff was a guy named Josh Mandel. And uh, Josh was really formative in getting me involved in politics. I would come to D.C. every summer. I would go to Young America's Foundation conferences. I would, I would do all this. I was involved in college, high school Republicans. I was involved in college Republicans. I was an officer in the college Republicans. I dropped out of college to be a, uh, a staffer for the RNC. Um, and then I came out here and I worked in Congress. And uh, what really kind of started opening my eyes, um, and, and this might have been because uh, I worked for a senator from Arizona, and Arizona has a disproportionate amount of older people, and older people tend to be more conspiratorial, um, is among my legislative portfolio was responding to people who would write in about conspiracy theories. And so I started learning all the kind of stuff that Glenn Beck was peddling. Um, I would, you know, hear from people who really believed in chemtrails. And yes, the CIA ran a secret air base out of Arizona, you know. To go to well, and now one of them is the chair of the Republican Party in Arizona. Yeah, no, Ellie Kemp Ward. Kelly. Ellie Kemp Ward. Ward. And, you know, uh, I mean, well, going back to John McCain, uh, John McCain, when he ran against J.D. Hayworth, literally went nuclear on J.D. Hayworth in the primary to destroy him for being conspiracy theorist, which he he was then and is now. And that was good. Um, but, you know, you want to talk about like, oh, Glenn Youngkin won. Are Republicans going to be able to pull this off everywhere? The answer is no, because they're not going to be able to pull off this primary and uh, they're not going to have any candidates. Uh, they're going to have more Kelly Wards than they are going to have uh, Glenn Youngkins. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's just all kinds of nuts. But my trajectory was when I started having to deal with elderly retired Arizona voters, um, you know, like one of them was like Glenn Beck said, if we gave every, you know, older person a million dollars to retire, uh, you know, like our economy would be saved if we made sure that they paid off their house, bought a car that was made in America and all this other stuff. And I did some back of the you know number of math and I was just like, how many trillions of dollars do you want to add to the U.S. debt? Like last I checked, Republicans were against, you know, big national debts and deficit spending. And mm -hmm. this was around the time of the housing crisis. But, um, you know, uh, I like I said earlier, I, I think you were a little ahead of the curve in us and realizing how crazy things were. But, you know, 2007, 2008 is when I started kind of getting hip to this. And, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm still in progress, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, in, in my own case, you know, I, I was, uh, it kind of started for me the, when I started writing a book, you know, at, so I left Mormonism in 2005, but I remained in Republican politics and I'm trying to build space for non-Christians in the Republican Party and, you know, be more inclusive of women and um lesbian and gay people like that was my thing um and eventually i came to the conclusion that the people who i was working with you know were you know 
who were giving money to people that funded me, um, they hated non-Christians. Um, they hated Muslims. They hated gay people. They hated lesbians, transgender people. And that that was really what was motivating them. Um, and that for me, you know, I had written 80,000 words of a book and it was very depressing to come to that realization that, wow, this could be the best written book in human history. And it wouldn't persuade a single one of these people because they see themselves as God's personal servants. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, when it comes to religious theocracy, I mean, there, there, there is that rise. Um, you know, I mean, you grew up Mormon. I grew up Catholic. And, um, you know, you see this, we call them the rad trads on Twitter. You know, the So Rabba Marys, the Adrian Vermules and whatnot. Um, they hate the Pope. But gee, by by God, they they want a theocracy. Um, but um, you know, I, I I do agree with you that like um, the, the, I, I would say that there are two tangential rises. One is uh, people who do want a theocratic state, like these rad trads do. Uh, there are also people who, uh, like Emerald Robinson, who profess to be Christians, but also think that like you know. Uh, getting the shot is going to make you bioluminescently tracked by the government, you know, which is sort of like you have to have brain worms to think that. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I, 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 the other thing I realized about the Republican Party, uh, the deeper I got into it was, um, and it's, it's, I'm not going to say both sides here, uh, the deeper you get into partisanship, the more you realize that it's motivated by hatred of the other side. Um, and, and sometimes there's good reason for that, but most of the time there's not. And um, Republicans are very good at, at, at being spiteful, angry, and hateful of the other side. Uh, and you see this now, I mean, I live in Woodbridge, Virginia, near Quantico military base, uh, with the whole let's go Brandon thing. Brandon Brown, the NASCAR driver, grew up down the street from where I live. He went to high school literally a mile away from where I live. And, um, you know, this sort of coarsening of things, like they revel in it. And Trump gave them that sort of agency, uh, whereas, you know, the John McCain's and Mitt Romney's of the world and the George W. Bush's didn't necessarily give them that agency. But like Donald Trump was just like, pouring kerosene on the fire and was just like, oh, cool. Do you want to be a jerk to everyone about politics all the time? I'm your guy. And they're like, that's awesome. And that's a large segment of the Republican Party today, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. I, uh, being an asshole is a political identity. <laughs> sadly, um, sadly. Unfortunately. Um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, this uh, has been a good conversation. I appreciate you being here today, Jim. Um, I'm going to put up on the screen so people can find you. So you're at Jim Swift DC on Twitter. And the Bulwark address is, uh, remind me what that one is again. It's just, okay. it's just thebulwark.com. Okay. All right. Great. So thanks for being here today. And uh, I will see everybody next time. Oh, and uh, I guess, well, hold on. I got to <laughs> do my little plug at the end here. So yeah. Uh, um, as I said, um, uh, Theory of Change is part of the Flux community. That is a network of podcasts, podcasters and writers that we bring you uh, the details and the, on the larger trends in politics, religion, technology, and media. And our address is flux.community. And uh, if you want to keep up with the show, we are ha uh, the shows on Twitter at Theory of Change. And if you go to theoryofchange.show, you can get all of the episode archives, um, the audio, the video, the transcripts, all that good stuff. And then if you like what you saw here today, uh, please give us some love over on Patreon, patreon.com slash discoverflux. So thanks for being here today, and thanks for watching or listening, and I will see you next time. <laughs>